my name is Victoria Berg, and I'm a master's student at Gallatin, concentrating in climate change and human rights. This summer, I completed the field portion of my fellowship at the World Food Program, which is the food arm of the United Nations. I was in the Vulnerability and Assessment Mapping Unit, also known as VAM. I spent my time at the WFP focusing on the topics of climate change, human rights, and food security in East Africa. This summer, climate change was on everyone's minds and tongues, um, whether they believed it's something real or not. Um, and now we have a very narrow chance of limiting climate change um, to, to the two degree goal. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change pro projects that we are going to hit four degrees of warming by the beginning of next century if we continue on this current course. I find it pertinent to frame climate change as a human rights issue through food security, as food is a basic necessity for survival. And when inhabitants of a region are denied access to food, either through pricing or scarcity, uh, this can lead to unwanted migration, famine, and death. And therefore, food security falls under Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that everyone has the right to the standard of living adequate for health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary so social services. More strength is given to food security as a human rights issue through the International Covenant on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights, which mandates that nation states have the obligation to make forward progress to the best of their available resources in realizing these rights. For me, what it ultimately comes down to is the international community's accountability to affected people. What are the steps that we need to take to ensure that those who are affected by climate change and famine get the help that they need in order to live their lives with dignity? Is it better to mandate that climate change is a human rights issue and try to impose reparations through the form of foreign aid? Or should we continue to treat famine as a human rights crisis that can continue to, continue to be solved by classic scenarios and development? This is a main theoretical question that I attempted to answer this summer. And um, spoiler alert, I did not solve this. I did not solve famine. Um, and I will continue to try to answer throughout my career. So I spent uh, 10 weeks in Nairobi, Kenya at the WFP Regional Bureau for East and Central Africa. And um, the region was dealing with two countries where the population was at risk of famine, South Sudan and Somalia. In Somalia, approximately more than 3 million people require urgent humanitarian assistance, and 800,000 are on the brink of brink of famine. In South Sudan, the famine situation has been averted, but the food situation is still dire, with six million people facing food insecurity. So it's absolutely reductionist to say that climate change is the direct cause of these famine scenarios. Obviously, droughts are frequent in the region, and conflict and violence play a large role in creating famine. Climate change contributes to this famine by acting as an extreme event intensifier, in this case, drought and it worsens the impact of this event on already vulnerable people in the region. And here in this graph, you can obviously see that um, people who are food insecure have been increasing over the years. After a visit to South Sudan, David Beasley, the WFP's new executive director, stated that it's a disgrace upon the people of the earth. It's heartbreaking. It's not just right that in the 21st century to be facing all this brokenness with all the technology and wealth that's available in the world today. I fully agree with Mr. Beasley and will ex extrapolate that prevailing inequalities and inequities are the greatest issue that our world must combat and that this vast unfairness will be greatly intensified by environmental stressors such as climate change. Statistics can feel implicitly very static and while data and figures provide the best information in terms of factual basis, um, they can feel very distant and far away. I would like to delve a bit deeper into what the statistics mean for a person for people uh, affected by famines and food insecurity. In the humanitarian sector, people use the terms food insecure and food secure to describe food, situa food situations and populations. These terms can be very confusing, especially um, if you're fundraising to a donor population uh, where people just want to know, are people hungry? Where are they hungry? Why are they hungry? And how can we help? So food security combines food availability, food access, and food utilization. People are food secure when they have available and adequate access at all times to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to live a happy and an active and happy life. 
So therefore, a person could have the funds for food, but due to a protracted crisis in their area, they don't have access to food or access to a market. That person is then food insecure and in need of assistance. So famine and food insecurity can cause a host of other human rights issues. There are the obvious, obviously not having enough food to feed one's family, and then there's also the others that stem from, that are in, in, intricately linked to food security and stem from displacement and the loss of potential. For example, if a person has been displaced due to drought or conflict and they are now in a refugee camp, how do they vote? Or if a person experiences stunted development as a child and now has a loss of cognitive ability and can't get a job, what are his or her rights? So how does the VAM unit tackle the overwhelming <coughs> challenge of increasing food security and resilience in East Africa in order to mitigate these issues? It does so through data. Um, VAM provides assessments and food security monitoring. This generates information and factual basis for program design using traditional assessment methods as well as advanced and emerging technology to provide clear data and a timely situation on the ground. So an example of VAM data um, includes the following. It's survey and census data, it's um, MVAM, which is mobile technology uh, via SMS channels or other interfaces, it's global information systems, climate data, market data, data from partners and governments. It's, it's a lot of data, pretty much. Um, so in this uh, photo, you can actually see MVAM, the mobile VAM, which is used to collect food security data from places that are very remote or places that you can't get to for the face-to-face -face assessment. Uh, the MVAM units also pl playing around with two-way communication so that this data can be timely provided actually into the field to the beneficiaries who can look up food prices or scenarios in there where they live in markets. Um, this summer, what I worked on, this summer what I worked on is to help and edit and publish the Greater Horn of Africa Climate Change and Food Security Atlas. The document was rather large, it's over 300 pages, it's on A3 size paper, which is um, quite a size. So I also worked with the VAM team to draft a technical summary of the document in addition to stylized edits. This atlas uh, will be useful for both technical program planning and for policy making as it maps past climate trends, identifies geographic patterns of vulnerability, and aligns with trends in food security. And this will create a strategic tool for the region to shape adoption planning, program design, and policy making. And here you can just kind of see um, very intricate mapping that the team did with um, exposure to shocks, uh, sensitivity to shocks, adaptive capacity for those shocks, and then it all combines to get the hunger and climate vulnerability index, which is the final, the final slide. Uh, so people ask me a lot what it was like to be on the ground in a region that is experiencing famine. I cannot tell you firsthand horror stories of starving children. I was sitting at regional headquarters um, reading reports. What I can tell you are stories of the people I met who have dedicated their lives to ensuring that people have enough food to live active and healthy lives. Um, I can tell you about the intense logistical support that the WFP has in purchasing power in order to provide food to these people. Uh, it really taught me that human rights isn't always um, mass protesting, petitions, courts, um, people in the streets. It's sometimes almost quiet and preventative uh, because desperate people and governments foster scenarios that lead to unwanted circumstances and human rights uh, violations very, very, very quickly. So it's really important uh, for early detection and warning. Kenya itself was facing challenges with an ongoing drought, a deepening nutritional crisis in Turkana, strikes by national health workers, and a cholera outbreak in Nairobi, all in the face of a turbulent election period. However, in the main concern at Regional Bureau, was still um, lack of funding and donor fatigue in the face of widespread drought and protracted crises and conflict in the region. So really just some reflections from this is, is kind of the phrase, we must view the world as it is, but we must never forget the way that the world should be. Human rights is a very new field, and so you can say that whatever you do, with, especially with new technology, is really making progress, but how do we push forward in order to remain accountable to the affected population? How do we really, like, are we okay with the world, the way that the world is today? 
And so wrapping up, um, just continuing work, I will be uh, looking at basically a lot of the data that I got this summer and putting it towards my thesis, which is food security and human rights in the face of climate change, the possibility of progressive realization in East Africa with the support of developed nations, as well as hopefully, um, after this is complete, continuing my work with uh, UN and human rights NGOs. Thank you.